And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the, upcom the upcoming revi revisitation of his fantasy deck building game, The Veil. And the and the and the head of, and the head of um dar of I believe it was dar dar Death Angel Entertainment. I almost said Dark Angel Entertainment. That's a whole different thing. And one of the f and one of the few men in the temple who could probably understand what the hell hot dish is, the one and only Logan Gendron. How are you doing tonight, man? Mildra, thank you for having me. Thank you for com thank you for coming on. I would I would say thank you for. I'm happy to be here in the monastery. Oh, well, we're ha we're happy to have you. Now, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to um car to card games and subsequently deck building games, and what was it that made it stick? Um. Well, primarily where I started out with gaming was uh, with role-playing stuff mm -hmm. long, long time ago. And uh, card games, I'd done more traditional, you know, like poker and that sort of thing. Went back in junior high, I think I was playing, um, what was that called? Over, was it Overwatch? Something? No. Uh, I can't, over, oh, overpower. That's what it was. Yeah, I, I remember that. Yeah, that was it. Um, but uh, yeah, I was big into Magic: The Gathering. That was a big influence for me. And uh, first time I was introduced to a deck builder game was uh, my brother-in-law John introduced us to uh, Star Realms at a family gathering. And uh, I, I want to say it was a, a Christmas because during that whole <laughs> during that whole Christmas break, we're having Star Realms tournaments and we're all playing and trying to destroy each other. And it was it was a big blast and uh, kind of opened my eyes to uh, the possibilities of of uh, those kind of games. And yeah, I wanted to look into them more and see what else was out there. And yeah, good stuff. Mm hmm. Now, you I th now on your page you had meant you had mentioned dipping dipping into Magic the Gathering and that, and then a few others. When it comes, um, obviously obviously there's a vast difference between the CCG and a deck building game. But aside from possibly the self-contained nature of deck builders, what what was it that struck with that struck a chord with you with um the pr with the sandbox of a deck building game? Um, I had actually just, uh, completed, um, my own attempt at a CCG with, uh, my cousin Sean. Um, we had built a Civil War card game and then we, uh, did an additional card game that was kind of a sequel to it with the 300 Spartans and the Greco-Persian War, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, when I, when I saw, um, deck builders and the, the thing that really attracted me to it was the simplicity of it um it there wasn't a lot of uh heavy-handed mechanics going on um at least with the ones that i really liked uh they were very approachable um so approachable that i i, I think you know a lot of younger kids can even play it uh without any difficulty and i don't know i like i liked the idea of just not having to spend a lot of time learning all the rules. You just open the thing up and it's pretty intuitive and you, mm -hmm. you lay out some cards and, you know, you can spend a half an hour and have a blast. Or if you've got a chunk of time available, you can spend a good couple of hours and still keep playing around with different strategies. Uh, that really, that's really something I appreciate. Yeah. And now would it, would it be fair of me to say that the, that, 
the veil was designed to to kind of to kind of bring those two major influences together um card games and role playing games yeah absolutely um you know with with the veil i originally started it with just the idea of doing a deck building game where each player has their own market um their own uh place where they can buy their cards so to speak mm-hmm. um that was the original concept. Um, one of the things that I hadn't really seen when I was exploring other deck builders is um, a lot of times everyone's going after the exact same cards and everyone's decks end up looking very similar. You know, they're all grabbing the same types of cards that they want. And it didn't feel very... Um, it, it didn't feel like you were playing different classes Mm-hmm. so to speak. You you weren't playing different characters. You were all kind of playing the same character. And so what I wanted to see was um if you're if you're playing like a cleric, it's gonna look and feel very differently than if you're playing a necromancer or a demon or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, the different characters I want that I wanted the decks to look and feel differently. The uh the story for the veil and like the role-playing side of it that you were asking about, that was kind of brought in on the very first Kickstarter um, when a lot of the backers were asking about the game and they were like, hey, what, you know, what do you have going on for solo? Like like a solo mode. And I was like, uh, I don't. I don't have anything for a solo mode. What are you talking about? Enlighten me, you know? And so a lot of the backers were telling me about, you know, what they liked and what, what they see in other games. And it's like, okay, that's that's interesting and i thought about the idea of just building like uh an automated ai for them to play against but uh i saw it as an opportunity to kind of tell a story Mm -hmm. and be a bit more engaging with it so what i ended up doing with the um, what we ended up calling the campaign book is setting it up more like a choose your own adventure kind of game so you go in and you start on the first page and then you have a series of choices that you can make after each battle and that'll kind of steer you into different directions and get you different rewards and allow your character to progress in different ways so i thought it was a fun way of giving people uh, a solo adventure that wasn't just automated mechanics there was more to it than that hopefully to engage the players a little bit as well yeah i'm um, get i'm guessing that now you you mentioned look you mentioned looking into some some other um um deck builders and the whole everybody's everybody's um dip, dipping into the same pond. What were mm-hmm. what were some of the other things that you had that you had seen in a, in other deck builders that you wanted to either minimize or avoid? Yeah, um I won't give too many specifics on on other uh, games out there, but a lot of what I was seeing um, when I was playing around with different deck building games out there is they would they would add a lot of mechanics and a lot of um, I, w- I would say heft to the simplicity of the the bare bones of a deck builder. They would they would be adding different gimmicks or different things that basically would complicate the process more, make mm-hmm. the game slower, um, or just add... To me, it felt like some, some of them were adding things just for the sake of having more to do. And the thing that I liked the best about um, some of the deck-building games was the elegance of, of the simplicity, so to speak. Like, mm-hmm. you could have a lot of strategy and not have heavy mechanics uh, weighing it down. In my opinion, you can have a lot of strategy without heavy mechanics. So, yeah, that was that was something that I, I kind of got into the mindset of how much can I strip away uh, from from a from a game and still have it be functional and interesting and tactical. Um, so that was that was kind of the mindset that I was in as I was developing the veil. Mm-hmm. And it's fun it's interesting that you mention um st- you mentioned strategy with without excess mechanics. Um 
like in, the, in that regard, now everybody has a different definition for how they see strategy insofar as a card game. How, how do you see it, and where do you differentiate it from, say, tactics? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess I, I think of tactics as far as uh, individual tricks or plans that you'll try and execute against an opponent. Whereas I think of strategy as how is it you want to develop yourself as the game is progressing? Um, how is it you want to... Uh, you know, wh which cards do you want to purchase from your market? Uh, how do you want to focus into your synergies? Um, how do you want to respond to what your opponent is doing? Um, I think tactics a lot of times are less... Uh, tactics can be a little less intuitive as far as on the fly uh adjustments that you're making whereas mm -hmm. a strategy is a lot of times going to be you can you can be a bit more fluid and when you see your opponent uh going one way you're you're going to want to veer in a different direction to be able to play against their weaknesses that makes sense now one of the th one of the things that i noticed when it came to the strategy thing and this is i'm guessing this is where so, where some of the um, magic influence is is in reg is in regard to the um, three car the um, three card types with the fate deck, you know, aggro, control, support. Yeah. Um, was that was that at all influenced by the fi by the um, five co by the five colors? Well, not technically five, but you, but I think you get where I'm going with this of Magic: The Gathering, where <laughs> Each of, where if somebody if somebody say has a red deck in Magic: The Gathering, you can generally have an idea about what sort of what sort of moves they're going to be making. Yeah, right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it was it was definitely a, a factor in that. I I wanted to have some simple color psychology in the mm -hmm. game where you know you would without even reading any text, without even reading any context of the card, you could look at the color and you could have a vague idea of, oh, th this is going to be in this general category of, you know, things that c it can do. Mm -hmm. And um, I was trying to, I mean, obviously I wasn't uh, running it exactly as Magic does. I wanted to differentiate it. So I, I started thinking about um, other types of games, even outside of card games, I started thinking about, like... Uh, different tactics that I would play in like StarCraft or StarCraft 2, that sort of thing, where it's like you've got very aggressive builds and then you've got other builds where you kind of turtle up and, and try and hold off your opponent until you can get just bigger than them in your technology or whatever. Um, and then there's economy builds and that sort of thing. So I was thinking about just different aspects of strategy that are applied in different types of games. And uh, what I kind of decided on was um, simplifying it as much as possible and breaking it down into red being the mean, aggressive one and blue being something that's more controlling and kind of tricky. And then uh, the green being... Um, your economy and your uh, support, basically, as it was so named. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was as simple as I could come up with as far as breaking it down to its uh, most basic components. Yeah, and I've often s i've I've often seen. Um, so I've often seen some ca some cases where certain certain decks or certain playstyles are going are going to focus mostly on one color, and some t and sometimes um, that setup leads to hyper focus, where it w where it wants it wants you to do one col one color primarily. Um, in your in um 
in this particular case, does the does the veil put it put give give as much give as much emphasis to people who want to who want to multi spec when it comes to when it, com when it comes to their decks and when it comes to their um, strategies, comparatively speaking. Yeah, um, you can. It, it's really up to the player. Um, there are certainly benefits to hyper focusing into aggro. You're gonna you're gonna obviously deal more damage quickly. Um, but you're the the more you specialize, I would say, the more vulnerable you are to mm -hmm. other weak points. Whereas if you're gonna try and well round your build, um, you're you're not going to be as fast at damaging uh, than you would be with as the player who's going mostly red, um, but you're going to be less vulnerable. Um, so there's definitely going to be different ways to play each character. Um, I, I tried to make that a, a big point in the game design is not pigeonholing players who want to be a, like a glass cannon, for example, if you want to be a wizard who's a glass cannon, you totally can do that. I mean, you can you can you can damage to your heart's content, but mm -hmm. you go up against the wrong guy and he's just gonna impale you right away, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think it comes down to the players what you want to do, and that was the other thing I tried to do because uh, the veil has each each character has its own deck. Um, which I think differentiates the veil from a lot of other deck builders out there. Mm -hmm. um, so when when I was approaching each deck design, um, I had the general overall idea that you know aggro would be more damage and control would have more card manipulation and support would have more drawing abilities and economy and that sort of thing. But aside from those broad strokes, I wanted each deck to play a little differently. So aggro for the wizard deck is going to feel differently than aggro for the demon deck, so mm -hmm. to speak. And when it came, when it came to the whole um, each each class effectively being it being its own being its own starting deck and fate deck, something mm -hmm. I'm something I'm curious about is. Were there were there any situations early on where you where you had to retool um, certain decks because you felt that it was leaning a little bit too closely to another? Yes, absolutely, especially for the first set. Um, actually, when I was in the initial design for the first set, I had to redesign from scratch the uh, cleric paladin deck. It's called uh, Champions of Faith. Mm -hmm. I had to. I had to. I had to redo that deck completely from scratch because it just it bored me when I was playing it. It was like it wasn't unique enough. It wasn't interesting enough. So I I basically just scrapped it and I uh, recycled some of the art that I had picked out for the first design of it. And other than that, I basically just started over. Oh, all right. And when and um when it comes now. One of the other th one of the other things that was I was curious about that I'm I'm not in I'm not entirely sure was li was listed is in regard to the resource economy. Um, mm -hmm. Now, wh how e how easy or how difficult was it to balance that when you were developing the game? Because, um. Since you've played Magic, you're probably familiar with the terms mana screwed and mana flooded. Absolutely, yeah. So were were there instances of gen of um, coin generation setups that you that you had to th that you had to throw out because it was either being too generous with giving resources or too lim and or too limited with resources, or were you able to strike a balance fairly quickly? I think it. I think it wasn't too difficult to strike a balance on that. Um, the decks that ended up being weaker on that category uh, in, in the first set was the Assassin deck, and mm -hmm. I want to say the Wizard deck as well had problems with that. 
So what I ended up doing for the assassin deck is I gave um, a card called Bounty in the in the opening hand uh, for, for the starting deck for that, which gave an additional uh, an additional coin. It gave you two coins instead of one. And then for the wizard, I ended up giving him a card called Alchemy, which um, it's still kind of just a weak generates one coin, but you can banish it, which is basically like uh, removing it from the game. Mm-hmm. You can remove it from the game uh, to generate an additional coin. So I just kind of c- tried to come up with different ways that the decks could solve those problems um, and, and and still feel different from the other cards in the other decks. So that was that was a goal, so that, you know, the wizard's having a problem with economy, so I solved that with one particular design and then when i come across a different issue i had i had to come up with a different solution i didn't want to keep putting out the same uh design solutions <laughs> if i ran into the same problem yeah and since since this is a, since this is a game that's very clearly using classes and give and given mm-hmm. our respective backgrounds with D, with D&D um this is where this is where I have to bring up the old joke about about how anybody who's not a mage in D and D tends to get the short end of the stick, right? Um, how and ov- obviously there's get obviously there's going to be um, casting centric um, decks within um, the veil and non casting centric decks. Um, yeah. What do you what? did you decide to do in order to differentiate them to make sure that both of them are going to feel unique? Well, um, a lot of that comes down to uh, the art feeling different, and Mm -hmm. there's different mechanics for each of the decks. Um, I I tried to come up with mechanics that would be specific to... uh, certain abilities so like i i attributed discarding a card to either like fire damage or bleeding damage Mm -hmm. so you end up seeing that quite a bit with um the hunter deck because he's shooting people with arrows and then uh, you see the you see fire damage in a couple of different decks um so for the discard ability a lot of times i had to rein that back a little bit just because I didn't want I didn't want there to ever be a point where your opponent is forcing you to discard almost your entire hand every turn because mm-hmm. that would not be fun at all <laughs> um, but yeah other than that you know distinguishing them with uh, just different types of mechanics um, that are unique to that particular deck so like the paladin and the cleric deck uh, you've got auras that kind of affect kind of kind of like a enchant world from Magic mm-hmm. the Gathering. You could think of it as it, it affects yeah. the whole playing board in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, and the uh, you know the non the non casters in the first set uh, would include like the assassin and the gladiator. And I basically just made the gladiator like tanky as hell. Um, he's just got the highest hit points, and he's very weak on healing because uh, that's just not what he does. But it's going to take you know even a even a really good player who's who's really comfortable with the wizard. It's going to take him a long time to chip down that health. Um, and the assassin would be another one where. Um, He's more of like a mid-range as far as his life goes, Um, but he has like the assassinate ability, and a lot of his abilities just uh, revolve around um, slaying a recruit that's in play uh, Mm -hmm. without damaging it. You just you just insta kill it. So there were different 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 ways I could uh, try and play to the strengths of the characters, even if they weren't wizards. Um, when now when it comes to when it comes to the whole differing um health between between classes, since I I've kind of mm-hmm. dan- I've kind of been dancing with the whole notion of the of themes and preferred playstyles within those themes. Um, with yeah. char- with characters that ha- that are more ta- that 
that are not exactly as tanky, a bit more glass cannony. Um, mm -hmm. how are how are they balanced out so that it do, so that they're lower up uh, so that they have something that counterbalances the lower um, health values compared to the more tanky folks in the game? Yeah. So um, what I ended up having to do with a couple of characters, I'll give you the most extreme example. In the second mm -hmm. set, I have a character that's called the Imp, and he has 15 hit points, which is crazy low. I mean, it's like you're you're doing you you can be doing six damage per turn on your very first turn in this game, um, so having 15 health is insane. But what I ended up doing with that character is um, I gave him a bunch of shields at the beginning, um, and in in this game, uh, a shield recruit is something that has to be damaged or killed before your hero can take any damage. Mm -hmm. So with the imp you throw out these shields and they're going to be taking the damage for you for a long time. Um, and it, it does actually uh, keep most of the damage away, at least until you can build up some other ways of surviving. Um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of the, the way to, to really drop health as low as I possibly could. I'm, I'm never going to bring anything lower than that imp though. That was, when I was play testing it, it was it was basically like, how low can I bring this guy? How low can I bring him down? You know, and and just slowly tweaking it until I decided on fifteen for him. <laughs> yeah, and I I can. Um, that's def that's definitely something I could I could see. Um, now a big a big thing that uh, that I am in favor of when it comes to. When it comes to any sort of game that can be that is gonna have is gonna have some sort of multiplayer component, is that of reversals? You know the the mm -hmm. idea that even if even if somebody has a significantly large gap between their between their opponent's life and their own, that doesn't mean that they're completely safe. The the um, opponent could still could still come back if they know if they know what they're doing. Um, Mm -hmm. When you were te when you were testing, did reversals happen where somebody seemed to be um, one t one hit away from death and still managed to end up coming back? Uh, yes, um, I, I end up calling that uh, swingy games. Uh, I don't know if that's a technical term or not, but basically the idea of it's like oh yeah, you you get way low and then you're able to swing it back and mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, I do. I did try to keep that possible, but I did try to minimize that a little bit. Because um, what I don't like is when uh, I don't want the games to be completely random for two people that are of similar skill level. Um, if you if both players know what they're doing, and uh, I, I feel like that should be reflected in the chipping away at each other's life total. Um, if, if one person is new to the game and the other one's a veteran, I think those those sorts of environments is where you really want to have those reversals still exist in mm -hmm. the game, um, because otherwise the new player is never going to be able to beat anyone, um, and that's no fun, and then they're not going to be a new player for very long. They're just going to stop playing the game. No. So as far as cranking numbers on that, I would. my goal was to try and get it to about like 25 percent where you could still have a reversal like that mm -hmm. but you know on a long enough timeline the the player who has more experience or is more familiar with the deck is going to have, have some advantages yeah and another if another um comparison that i, that I have to bring up when it comes to magic and the and this is the is the mm -hmm. notion of people of people having a habit of some sort of top card or some sort of ace card that they will tr that they will try and dig for late game um mm -hmm. within the within the fate decks that that are that the veil vale has would there be any would there be any instance of something like that or what or is it or is it more of a case where it's about using um death by a thousand cuts more than it is an assembled bomb no there's there's definitely bombs in each of the decks um I, that was 
what I what I tried to do with that is having the higher cost cards, so the the cards that cost six or the cards that cost seven. There's kind of a exponential increase of power uh, in in those higher end cards, and I tried to get. It it wasn't so much trying to. I'll just I'll just say, when when you're when you're building in bombs like that, you don't necessarily have to worry about each bomb being exactly balanced which with each other bomb because they're crazy good no matter what. So it's like, have, I was trying to use those as excuses to just have fun with the game design and just have those power cards that aren't necessarily 100% equal with each other, but they're just awesome and you want to get them, you know? Yeah. Now, some, something else that I find, it, that I find interesting with the... Um... With the effects, with the effect system, is the concept of um, banish of self banishing. Um, was that yeah. was that a, was that something that was developed early on in the game, or is that something that you at, that you added in be, to get to give at least a little bit more risk reward in um, play tests? Uh, no, that was self banishing. That was in there fairly early. Um, one of the things that I, again, wanted to prioritize with this game is I I wanted the game to move quickly. Um, I don't want you to have to spend a lot, lot of time in the earliest phase of the game where, you know, you, you just have the weakest stuff and you can't quite dig deep enough to get what you want. Like I wanted I wanted the game to move quick. So mm -hmm. it's like. Um, one of the one of the things I did specifically with this game to help that along is I, I have a card called Dispel and uh, Not uh, let's see Notorious I think is what it's called mm -hmm. but it's basically they're the same card they they just allow you to uh, get rid of something in your hand or get rid of something in your fate route uh, every every time you play that card and it was a, just a a quick way of speeding the game along faster um, so that you're digging deeper into the cards that you want and you can uh, spend less time in the earliest phase of the game. So yeah, that was something I wanted from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, now when it comes to when it comes to recruits um, w with the with the recruit setup, did you did did you want to make it want to make it sure that every class can potentially have recruits for one and two, that um recruits don't outshine the character class itself? Um. Yeah. Uh. I did want to have some recruits available for each of the decks, but there's a lot of variety between the different classes as far mm -hmm. as you know which which decks have the most. Uh, either the stronger recruits or the most number of recruits, that sort of thing. That, that was, that was a bit of a balancing act to try and get that right. Um, and yeah, like as far as making them outshine the, the character class, um, each character has an ability that's built into them. Mm -hmm. um, actually this, this was a little bit of an influence from Hearthstone. If any of your guys have played some blizzard games, but, uh, I liked the idea of having each class just have an innate ability. Um, so if you have extra resources on a given turn, or um, you know, depending on what the what the ability is, that you can kind of utilize your class and keep him a active part of your game, um, not just not just a health total, but something that he's contributing to mm -hmm. your strategy or or whatnot. I gotcha. And when it comes, did I miss a second part to that question? <laughs> no, not no, not really. The um, to follow up on that, when it comes to the shield mechanic, you know the the where that where um that particular um recruit has to be taken care of first before you can do any sort of direct attacks. Um, how ubiquitous would would shield yeah. recruits be for? Um, so for certain decks, would there be some decks that use it more than others, or is it a case where there's going to be a few shield decks in, in um, or not a few shield decks, a few shield recruits, 
and um, every day. Yeah, yeah. Again, it was trying to um, um, yeah. The, the, sorry, you, you broke out a little bit there, but I think I think the question was uh, uh, about having shield recruits or mm -hmm. fewer shield recruits in particular decks. Is that what I heard? Yeah, is it a, is it a case where there's a f where there's going to be a few in every deck, or so, or some decks going to have more um, shield recruits than others? Yeah, there's definitely some decks that lean heavier into that than others, mm -hmm. um, and there's some decks where the shield recruits are just straight up better than another deck's shield recruits. So there might be fewer of them, but they have higher hit points or they're harder to get through. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a shield recruit in the second set that he has a... Um, he's like, he's unslayable essentially, where you can't use... I, I, the slay mechanic is what we call the instant kill, where you mm -hmm. don't have to damage somebody, you just kill it. And... Uh, yeah, he, so he has high hit points, and you can't just instantly kill him. So you gotta you gotta really commit some damage to him before you can get through. So there's only one of those in the deck, but he's uh, once you get him, he's one of those cards that can really change the game and possibly even uh, help you with a, a one of those swingy matches that you were that you were hoping to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and when it when it comes to the one of the um. One of the notes that I saw in the ma in the manual was uh, was on how was is on how the op the opening fate route can be can be a can be a deciding factor. I.e., don't ro don't um don't do the fate route don't do a fate route or ask for a mulligan if there's too many um, cards in there that have a cost of five. Um, yeah, was that something that, that... that happened often early on? I tried to uh, I tried to uh, run the numbers on it so that statistically it doesn't happen too often. But mm -hmm. that's one of those instances where um, some of my earlier playtesters, you know, they'd see one of those really good cards come out, or three of those really good cards, and they they want to keep them all. But it's like you you will never be able to buy any of those awesome cards because you don't have the economy built yet like you have to build into it first so um yeah those those mulliganing out some of those uh slots of your fate route was something that i wanted to draw attention to so that newcomers when they're playing the game for the first time hopefully that they're they're not too tempted <laughs> uh t to uh, force themselves into a situation where they're mana screwed essentially mm -hmm. um because that again it, it's like you want the game to be as intuitive as possible, um, and I, I always lean on the side of minimizing um, rules as much as possible. But I needed to have something in there, so it's like if you just flat out get a draw that it's gonna um, it's gonna lead to an eventual loss, no matter what you do. I wanted something built in there where you could um, make that so it didn't happen. Yeah, and when it comes. Um, speaking of that whole sim simplicity, um, when it is is there gonna, would there be a case where there are where there are certain cards or effects that are that um are out of turn triggers, i.e., i.e. some sort of reaction or the or the like? Um, I n not exactly. No, my initial design for that, um, I did have, uh. I guess what you would you would call in Magic the Gathering like an interrupt or an instant, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But basically the idea of playing something outside of your turn. Um, but I found that it added too much complexity that I was trying to avoid. So I, I pulled that out pretty early. And I what I did instead is I, I would put some mechanics directly on the cards that would have... Uh, triggers that might happen on the other person's turn, but it's not something that you play on your turn. So, for example, um, we have some poison stuff that happens uh, in the second set. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, poison missile or uh, 
poison maelstrom or something like that and it does uh it does some damage to the opponent when it's in your own discard pile so it's like it's it's amping up how much damage you're dealing but it's not something that you played that particular turn Mm -hmm. um another example would be um like cold or frost abilities or ice abilities i tried to incorporate that uh as an ability where it doesn't um your opponent can't draw extra cards if you played a an ice spell um so on your turn you played an ice spell and it does its normal thing but then on their turn when they play a card that allows them to draw extra cards you can be like ah ah ah, nope you're frozen i already got you you know or however you want to say that Mm -hmm. (laughs) oh so yeah i I did i did try to avoid um stuff happening uh you playing things from uh, outside of your turn I guess the only other, sorry, I, I thought of one other example of that that does um, go more into what you're talking about. Uh, some of the ward spells in the second set, you reveal them from your, your hand on your opponent's turn, and it does some sort of effect. So, like, uh, to you, or you reveal a card to prevent a discard. Um, so there's there's different triggers that, that you can do in that way, but you, you're not actually playing the card from your hand. It's just you have it, and the only reason that you're revealing it is basically proving that, yes, I have this, you can't do that to me. Mm-hmm. Now, when it, now, when it comes to... Now, some, something that I... Something that I did, that I didn't see that is definitely in the basics and I probably should have asked about this earlier is <laughs> the me- is the method of generating the resource to actually get cards from out of from the fate deck. Now, yeah. some some will use um fi- some will use physical coins. Well, not physical in terms of the coins that we use to buy we use to buy things IRL, but um um some so- some sort of cutouts. Um and so, and some will have it where the cards are were do double duty as resources. Um, how yep. do you have it set up? Yeah, I didn't. I don't have uh, tokens or counterstones or anything like that because mm-hmm. at the end of a turn, any resources that you didn't spend uh, evaporates into the ethers. So you don't you don't get to keep it beyond that turn. So I didn't see a need to involve counters or anything like that into the game. So you, you play a card from your hand, and it tells you it generates one or two coins or whatever, and uh, you've got those coins to spend, either on your hero ability or on cards that you have in the fate route, mm-hmm. and you spend it. And then, you know, if you bought something from your fate route, it goes into your discard pile, and then later on when you run out of cards, it, you shuffle it all back up and start your start your hand all over again. Yeah. Now when it co- now um some something that I'm a bit curious about is now since since this is the second go the second um go around with the with the veil with um mm-hmm. with mo- with basically more up more of it with the addition with the addition of a of another campaign and, and some more classes. Um, mm-hmm. what what would you say were some of the learning experiences you or and the biggest takeaways you had from the from the first um edition of the Ve- of the veil compared to this re- compared to this revisited um take? Yeah. Um. So each time I do a Kickstarter project, I get a lot of feedback from backers and potential backers and. Mm-hmm. they'll ask questions that I never thought of. And sometimes it's a case of uh, being too close to the forest to see the trees or whatnot. <laughs> um, so, you know, I always get additional ideas, additional inspiration each time I do a, a crowdfunding launch. Um, the very first set, I had mentioned that I I didn't have any plans for a solo, uh, a solo mode for the game. And then, you know, from different conversations I had that developed into a, a whole giant campaign book. And um, in the second set, 
I knew I was going to do a campaign book again because people loved it. And I had backers that were just buying the game because I had a solo mode. Um, and in that second set, uh, the, the idea had come along. Hey, what about having cards that we could fight against from the campaign? Because originally the campaign book was just that. It was just a book. Um, but a lot of players were like, hey, can you release the enemies um, so that I can just have a physical enemy in front of me when I'm playing it? And it's like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I wish I'd thought of that. You know, so the, the Veil revisited the current crowdfunding page was um, basically to catch up set one up to all the ideas that had come into fruition with set two, like the um, enemies and allies and... Uh, also having more uh, female classes, which was just an oversight on my part when I was first developing it, because um, the first set, uh, I had some additional constraints on what I could afford as far as art goes, because mm -hmm. uh, it was my very first uh, pro project as, a, as an individual game designer. And so I had a limited, well, more limited budget, let's say. <laughs> and... Uh, so yeah, that was one of the other things I'm doing with the Veil Revisited right now is adding some additional uh, art to the first set and kind of getting it up to speed with uh, what all the backers wanted in the mm -hmm. second set. Now, you have spe you specifically built build the Veil as a dark fantasy game. Yeah. Um, now, I'm um, some. Which isn't which is interesting to me because get because now D, given the two given the two big inspirations that we've that we've mentioned many times throughout this, um, obviously Magic the Gathering is what what style of fantasy it is depends on which set you're talking about. Um, some of them right. were very very much on the realm of dark fantasy, and some of them were on the complete opposite end. Hi Ravnica, how are you doing? Um, <laughs> so what I'm curious, what I'm curious about is of all the, di of all the different styles of fantasy, why specifically did you go with, um, dark fantasy? Was it just the sort of fantasy that you, gr that you grew up with or was there something else? Oh yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, that, that one has nothing to do with Magic the Gathering or Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I loved Diablo 2 and Diablo 2 Lord of Destruction and man I I played that game to death. Uh it's just just you know looking back at it now it's kind of like you know those action adventure games have kind of played out a bit in more recent years but when I was a kid uh that game I loved it and it was like it was dark and it was creepy and you know I felt I don't know how old was I when I was playing that I want to say it was like junior high school or something like that, but it's kind of like looking over my shoulder, like, Oh, am I going to get in trouble for playing this game? You know, are my parents going to find me doing this? And I just, I just loved that feeling of, uh, of, you know, what, what Diablo two was for me. Mm -hmm. And when it was coming down to, you know, what, what's a, what's a type of game or, or game design that would really, that I would, I would love to just be delving into that world for years at a time. Um, that, that's what, that's what drew me to the idea of dark fantasy. Yeah. And I think it's, I, I think dark fantasy as a genre is really interesting because you have, um, you've got, you know, the spell casters and that, you know, magic, uh, and, and powerful characters or whatever, but you also have, in my mind anyway, dark fantasy brings an element of horror as well. Mm -hmm. And those two ideas of, of power builds um and and horror are almost conflicting game ideas i would say um because for me um a, a really good horror game you are very much not in control and you're very much in danger of just getting annihilated at any given moment you know and, and part of the fun of those types of games is like oh my god am i gonna am i gonna be able to survive is is there some horrible creature lurching, lurking behind this corner that's just going to devour me? That sort of thing, mm -hmm. and that's um, that's very different from a lot how a lot of uh, um, 
magic and how a lot of games build in a a power set or or a um, a power elevator <laughs> as your character's developing, and that that was that was an interesting balance for me to try and um, to, to try and walk that tightrope between those two worlds of uh, really powerful characters, but also you could die at any given. So yeah, mm-hmm. and now for now for me, I've um, I'm as you've probably as you've probably seen in some of my other stuff. I am a very big stickler when it comes to defining ge- defining genres and. Mm-hmm. That's what it, something that I'm cur- something that I'm curious about when it comes to your when it comes to your take, given that this is a dark fantasy game, and as we mentioned before, um, there's a bit of a cl- there's a bit of a clash that goes on with that particular style. Yeah, where where would you how close would you say the line is between something like dark fantasy and something like say swords and sorcery? Uh, I lost you at the very end of that question. How close would I say? Uh, what is dark fantasy, and what was the other? Um, sword and sorcery. Since those hmm. two, those two can those two can kind of um, be a Venn diagram with each other at times. Yeah, I think a lot of times uh, it just comes down to the power dynamics of the characters. Like, mm-hmm. are you? Uh, um, is your is your character ramping up? really quickly and are you are you killing you know hordes and hordes of monsters at any given moment or is it like you've got um or 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 is it that you have a little set of skills that you can use or a few spells that you can use and it's like you've got a limited quotient of it and uh you have to you have to choose your battles otherwise you're going to get devoured you know i I think for for me that's kind of where that distinction lies is is uh how how fast do your characters progress how fast do they how overpowered or do they become and what is the what is the scale of the enemies that you're facing i don't know i don't know if you'd agree with that or not what's your take on dark fantasy versus sword and sorcery Meldra? um when it comes I'd say the I'd I'd say um when it comes to when it comes to something like dark fantasy I feel I feel the emphasis should be um the things that go bump in the night the fact that you're never the fact that you're you're never completely safe you're safer um mm-hmm. if you don't mind me using a video game example um because it's kind of, because it kind of portrays itself as a dark fairy tale um not that not that I'm overusing the term dark on this, but dark wood comes to mind where at during the day you, of course you have to you have to forge and the like, and during the night it's about surviving indoors while there's something that wants to try and get in and um do things to you um right right and ev- even if you're in say a village or a, or a settlement i mean yeah, it beats the hell out of venturing out into the wilderness, but again, you're only safer, you're not safe. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. Whereas sword and sorcery yeah. focuses far more on um far more on a humanistic approach instead instead of man instead of man versus monster or in some cases the monster that is man. And you tend you tend to have high amounts of brutality in sword and sorcery but also characters overcoming through wits. And you de- and right. um, you also have the you also have Robert E. Howard's issues with civilization. You know, where ci- where civilization, if if you look at a lot of his work, is often depicted as haughty, decadent, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, largely a reflection of what happened when the uh, town that he was in struck oil. Right. Huh. Um. And that that's all and admittedly that's not a that's not a hard and fast thing cuz like i said the line bet- the line between the two can cross and hell howard had collaborated with hp lovecraft once 
Right. So it's a it's, yeah. No, it's it's interesting. I uh, it's less of a good fences between neighbors and more of a Venn diagram between between the two, and that tends to be how it works a lot with um with genre. But it's still it's still good to have a solid yeah. foundation to build around. Um, I will admit that when I was going through a lot of the stuff for for um the for the veil, I ended up the game I ended up mm -hmm. being reminded of, and I'm not sure if you've played this in the last few years was Shadow of the Demon Lord. I have never played it, but I'm gonna write it down. That'd be good to good to see. Mm-hmm. You said Shadow of the Demon Lord? Yes. Okay. Oh. Largely because of the fact that that, that that one is also doing a dark fantasy approach. Um argu arguably a bit pre apocalyptic, which I don't think I don't think that's where that's okay. where you're going. Um Oftentimes, whenever people ask about dark fantasy, I always tell them, "Look at f look at fairy tales, and then look at the German version of fairy tales." That's half the work done right. for you. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Like, look, my fr look. The first opera, I ever, the first classical opera I ever listened to was Die Frisch Schultz. If you'll if you'll forgive my bad German, and yeah. The thing I will always remember <laughs> from that him. is the Wolf's Glen, where you have somebody getting eaten alive by wolves. Mhm. Mm um. Now, when it yeah, the old the old uh, the old fairy tales they 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 put a lot more um, faith in what a, the a kid could handle than our current culture does. That's for uh, sure. Um. I'd say I'd say if there's any I'd say if there's any modern modern takes when it comes to when it comes to fairy tales and con and contemporary storytelling. In that in that sort of dark fairy tale approach, um, some westerns I I say could go with that. Um, in fact, Joseph Campbell once described the western as a modern fairy tale. Um, mm -hmm. as well as th as well as things like um, Stranger Things. Now, putting aside mm -hmm. some of the '80s nostalgia that it that it's obviously trying to milk. <laughs> um, yeah. The reason the reason why I say that ties into some into something that that I remember reading about when it came to the, when it came to characters that kids find scary in Doctor Who, and the big one mm. that a lot of kids found found scary that adults didn't is the Weeping Angel, because the way something like that works of a of a creature that turns into a statue if you look at it, but moves when you tr when you blink um that is the ki that is the kind of thing that we would come up with as the as the monsters under the clo in the closet or under the bed kind of stuff as kids right huh yeah no that's interesting um yeah and like stranger things uh, you know I, they obviously had a lot of uh lovecraft influences in that story mm -hmm. too and um yeah, it's 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 interesting the idea of what's what's lurking behind the shadow shadows. What's what's the world behind our world? Mm -hmm. um, and that that's definitely something I was going for in in this game as well. It's just the idea of um, a, a spiritual battle happening uh, behind the scenes that. Um, that are the normal people, the, the the people that are just living their everyday lives. That there's a veil that they can't see past it, and they they don't even realize what's really going on. Yeah, that that was an idea that really resonated with me. And when it when it and I think the other the other thing that that certainly helps, and this is the reason why I brought up the whole German fairy tale thing, is um. Forests in Eastern Europe were a death trap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially forests in, say, Germany, um, po um, Poland. Um, depending on what, depending on what time of the year, Finland, because well, Finland is cold all the damn time. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
and because and because of that, there's the there's the whole there's the whole thing of there are things there are things out there that are mu that are much bigger, stronger, and and worse than you. So stay the hell inside. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I um I've read some how horror is defined specifically by the culture that it's in. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like the example that you just gave as far as all the all the old fairy tales, the the monsters would be out in the woods. You'd have you'd have the big bad wolf, or you'd have the the cannibal witch out there or whatever you know mm -hmm. those different ideas of the, the real dangers out in the forest and uh in american culture you know where we were pioneering out into the prairies and out into the wild and that was kind of considered uh what if, if you wanted to be worth your salt that's what you were doing you were you were out there pioneering our, our fairy tales would uh, the dangers being, um, you know, unseen in the home or in the city itself, and the how the cultural norms and the cultural expectations really affect what we are, what what we perceive as frightening. I guess is what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. There is the, there is. Definitely that. Now, for now, I do want I do want to give my congratulations for how well the um, Veil Revisited's um, campaign has been going so far. Because you're only asking for five hundred, and you're seventeen times seventeen eight, um, <laughs> de at least seventeen times over. I don't I don't feel like breaking out my calculator right now. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it um, yeah, I. I I priced it so low because we were only going to be adding uh, one deck as new content, and I didn't I didn't need to have a very large uh, price point to be able to print that, even mm -hmm. if I had a small number of backers, and so that my old backers would jump in, get their thing, and you know they'd they'd have exactly what they've been asking for for a year or two, <laughs> um, and then I. I was pleasantly surprised with uh, how many new people have been discovering it and checking it out and uh, uh, joining joining the campaign. So, um, yeah, I was uh, I, I wasn't expecting it to go as far as it has already, and uh, I'm very very happy that that happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. And. Now you've got now you've got the um, end date set at February nineteenth. Yeah. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a win as far as a window for this to go fit for this to um be out to the printers? Uh, well, usually with a Kickstarter launch, um, they send me the funding about two to three weeks after the campaign is concluded. Mm hmm. I always try and set up my Kickstarter project so I'm ready to go uh, as soon as as soon as the money hits the bank, so to speak. Um, I did build in quite a bit of, or what I perceived as quite a bit of extra time. Uh, I was free in for July of this year, mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, because COVID's happening, you know, a lot of printers are slowing down. That should be enough time, is what I was thinking, and I'm hoping that's still the case. But what I'm finding is it's not so much the manufacturing, but like the postal services are just so far behind at this point. Concerned that you know just because we've sent them out and attempted to deliver them by by sending it out in a shipment, that it, it still might take quite a bit um, before it's before it's in people's mailboxes, but. We'll do what we can, and we'll we'll no. Oh. All right, not obviously. I didn't. Obviously, I was I was um, I was predicting that there wouldn't be a hard and fast release date yet. Uh, that's why that's why I phrased it as window because obviously these things are always in flux.
Well, with that, with that said, I do. Um, I'm not gonna wish. I'm not gonna wish you luck because I don't want to jinx you. <laughs> <laughs> and just just to make sure, because you can never be too you can never be too um careful. And yeah, this, yeah. Besides, as as somebody who's done his fair share of tabletop gaming, you know that um, suspicions are a thing. Superstitions are a thing. You don't roll somebody oh, else's dice. Absolutely. I uh, somebody somebody recently asked me why why did I do a sixty day campaign, and it's like, well, I'm not superstitious, but every time I've done a thirty day campaign, it it failed, and every time I've done a sixty day campaign, it's it's uh, succeeded within the first week. So, yeah, I'm totally superstitious. <laughs> Look, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you're wrong. All right, exactly. Causation doesn't mean correlation, mm-hmm. but uh, if there's a correlation, uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with what's working for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Absolutely, Mildred. Thanks so much for inviting me. I, I feel uh, honored and privileged to be able to set foot in these hollowed grounds. Well, and anytime you see fit to return, whether it's another, whether it's a future plan with the veil, or if it's or if it's just a glorified shit post, the door is always <laughs> open. I as, appreciate that. I will. I will take you up on that, Mildred. As I say, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, I will get get to that right away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am Eurogaming Monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>